This is the Hot Zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. The future of war fighting and an unmanned arms race. All that's coming up on today's awesome episode of The Hot Zone. Hi folks, Chuck Holton here. Today we're going to do something a little bit different for the podcast. I want to talk specifically about the future of war fighting. That's what, what will our next major war look like? Uh, we're probably all familiar with the advances that have been seen in the civilian market with unmanned technology and drones and the like. But how is that being applied to the U.S. military? Well, today we're going to take a look at some of the advances that the military is making in that area, and we're going to hear from some of the soldiers and sailors and airmen and Marines who are using this new technology. Some of it's pretty exciting, and some of it, honestly, it's a little bit scary. Now, first off, I want to show you a testing facility being used by the U.S. Marines to try out some of these new technologies, so check this out. Today, what we're doing is a final exercise. For the past six weeks, these Marines of Kilo 35 and McWill have trained to the technologies that we're integrating. So at the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab, we test and evaluate future concepts and technologies. We have a concept-based experiment that we're doing. We have over 40 technologies here in, uh, with the CLT Kilo 35. Some of them range from uh, five unmanned ground vehicles to five unmanned aerial systems. We're looking at technology that reduces logistics, which we have termed logistics demand reduction. Now we have unmanned ground vehicles, which can actually carry 240s and 50 caliber weapon systems. And it can be right next to a foot mobile company. So now we're bringing weapon systems that are not normally foot mobile to the company itself. We have five unmanned aerial systems that we're going to be uh, playing with. One of them is the Black Hornet. It's about four inches long. It is brought down to the squad level. This thing cannot be heard after it goes above 30 feet. So you basically can peek around the corner without the enemy knowing, and you can see what is around the next corner for that squad leader to know. The small quadcopter that uh, had been flying around is called the Instant Eye. It has three cameras that allow it to see straight ahead, 45, or straight down. You can reach out and see what's coming at you and what uh, you can be expecting here in the next 100,000 meters. The 40 technologies that we're experimenting with will make the Marine Corps more efficient, more lethal, and more survivable. So ultimately what we want is the first person or first thing in the door is a robot to get essay into what's around the next corner. Well, okay, so that's pretty interesting. Having lost, I think, two inches of height myself during the time I was in the military because I was always carrying a heavy rucksack around, the idea of having an autonomous machine that will follow you around and carry all your stuff is frankly pretty awesome. <laughs> Uh, having another robot that would allow you to see around corners is great, and an armed robot that would bring a 50 caliber machine gun on a foot patrol is really hard to even imagine. I just hope that the AI in those things is good enough to tell friend from foe, you know what I mean? And, and that's what this next package is going to be about, uh, how the military is bringing together some of the world's best experts to move the industry forward in a way that's going to allow unmanned vehicles to actually help our warriors accomplish their mission without putting them in any more danger. As part of a strategy to develop and deliver new robotics capabilities to future soldiers, Army researchers have partnered with world-renowned experts in industry and academia. The University of Pennsylvania hosted a series of meetings in Philadelphia June 5th through the 7th for principal investigators and researchers from the Army's Robotics Collaborative Technology Alliance, or RCTA. So certainly the problem that we are working on is very hard. 
Um, it's recognized by a lot of people as, you know, it's not quite general artificial intelligence type stuff, but it is very difficult to operate robots in the wild, um, you know, anywhere in the world. And that's the kind of problem the Army has to solve. And the collaboration we have is with some of the world's best. The group formed in 2009 to bring together government, industrial, and academic institutions to address research and development required to enable the deployment of future military unmanned ground vehicle systems ranging in size from manned portables to ground combat vehicles. Partners include General Dynamic Land Systems Robotics, Carnegie Mellon University, the Robotics Institute, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Florida State University, the University of Central Florida, the University of Pennsylvania, Kinetic North America, and Caltech Jet Propulsion Lab. The thing that most encourages me is that we have ARL researchers doing joint research and collaborative papers with the best in the world um, from these universities. In order for robots to be teammates, he said, they must operate in unstructured, complex environments. We're trying to go from tools to teammates. So we want robots to not be a, a tool that you use, like for IEDs exploration, where you have to teleoperate it. We're trying to get them to be true teammates so that you can work side by side with them. So, for example, you can in, in articulate what you want the robot to do as your teammate and do those missions jointly. Or maybe you send a robot out and have the robot be able to communicate back to you what it's doing, what it saw in human, ter human understandable terms, not in robot specific terms, which humans don't understand. Over the past eight years of the Alliance, researchers have achieved many milestones in the robotics field. Collaboration is essential to what we do in Army Research Laboratory in order to access the best and brightest talent around the nation. Um, through the robotic CTA, the partners that we have have allowed Army objectives and research for the long term to be realized over a, a multi-year investment and collaboration with outside partners. The laboratory is focused on transitioning new capabilities to industry partners so they can continue to mature them. So the bottom line is that soldiers of the future who face very fierce near-peer adversaries will rely on the research that we're doing today to help them to maintain technological overmatch over an enemy which, frankly, we can hardly imagine today. The researchers said the meetings in Philadelphia were a valuable experience as they continue to plan for a capstone event where they will demonstrate the culmination of their research achievements to Army leaders. In order for the robots to be a useful teammate, they have to be able to communicate naturally like a human does. And so we're doing a lot of work in human-robot relationships. So understanding concepts in the same way that humans do, trying to get the robots to understand those concepts in the same way so that the teaming can occur more naturally. Okay, so finally I want to show you something really cool. The Army is actually now starting to take delivery of a new kind of heavy equipment transport that will dramatically reduce the danger to our troops on the ground. What I mean is this. You might remember that a couple weeks ago we had three Marines killed in Afghanistan as they went out on a, on a patrol, and they were driving in a heavily armored vehicle, but the bomb that they hit was so large it blew the entire front of the vehicle off. If you look back at the Iraq war, one of the most dangerous things you could do at that time was drive a truck from Kuwait City to Baghdad, and it's hard to even imagine how many troops were, were killed and maimed on those convoys. But without a doubt, it was far too many. Check in. I'm not hit, we're taking heavy fire, heavy machine gun fire. Now, logistics trains like that are typically one of the more dangerous things you can do in a battlefield because they typically don't have a lot of firepower with them, and they have to stick to the roads, which means predictable routes. And anytime you're predictable in war, your risk goes up. Well, in this case, the Army is now taking delivery of up to 20 self-driving supply trucks in the next year. They're called expedient leader follower trucks because there will still be drivers in the front vehicle, but they can now attach up to nine autonomous vehicles behind it that will follow automatically where the first truck goes. I think this is a really exciting technology, and the Army decided to name each one of the trucks after somebody who gave the ultimate sacrifice. So we're taking a tactical pause to step back and to reflect upon all of our collective efforts as a group. 
Major Andrew Scruggs is the military lead for Expedient Leader Follower, a project within the Army's newly formed Army Futures Command. His teammates are hosting a ceremony to dedicate each of the first 16 autonomous leader follower vehicles to one of 16 fallen motor vehicle operator soldiers who was killed in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so really the reason why we're dedicating these vehicles is because every time we get an engineer, uh, every time we get a government member that's a part of this team, this is complicated stuff that we're doing. Uh, it's a very high level of rigor uh, activities. Um, and sometimes people can get burned out. And, but when they see that vehicle data plate on that truck that they're working on, um, they're going to be reminded of why they're doing what they're doing. After so the military is now using autonomous vehicles. And get what I'm saying here. They're not remotely piloted vehicles. They're completely autonomous. And we're talking helicopters and uh, ground vehicles and all sorts of things. And they're using them from everything from surveillance to logistics to casualty evacuation and cargo delivery and much more. And I think we're going to see a lot more of this uh, without a doubt over the next five to ten years. This will dramatically change the face of war. One of the real concerning points is that we're not the only ones who are developing this kind of technology. Russia, for example, has a whole slew of autonomous vehicles already that they're testing. And the difference is that most of theirs are armed because you know Russia doesn't suffer from the same ethical dilemmas the United States does because they really don't care who they kill with their weapons. And of course, China will make anything for anybody as long as there's money involved. Uh, the intro to my show has a couple of clips of explosions from drone footage that was filmed by ISIS during the Battle of Mosul. ISIS employed off-the-shelf drone technology to kill more than 150 Iraqi troops just by attaching conventional grenades and bombs and stuff to drones and then flying them over concentrations of Iraqi troops. They also used drones to vector in suicide car bombs on their targets. So developing the technology to counter these kind of unmanned and autonomous vehicles is just as important as developing the vehicles themselves. And the military is doing that as well. For many, the concept of war on the ground has transitioned to the sky, hovering sometimes tens of thousands of feet in the air. Unmanned aerial vehicles, or drones, are a game changer, both They've for the good and the bad. The With a massive technology boom, uh, the enemy is able to get their hands on uh, UAS systems, commercial off the shelf. Combating against the threat of drones is key, as technological advances aren't slowing down. Here, Oklahoma Army National Guard members of 1st Squadron, 180th Cavalry Regiment, currently deployed to Afghanistan as part of Operation Resolute Support, conduct a drone training exercise utilizing counter UAS equipment. They flew a drone into our airspace here where we used some of our equipment to detect them within the electromagnetic spectrum. Then we sent out individuals to visually identify it, and then we started sending out some equipment so that we can defeat it using the same spectrum that that drone was operating on. The exercise and equipment was observed by Central Command's JDAT, or Joint Deployable Assessment Team, in order to determine any vulnerabilities. Here we are assessing counter UAS systems throughout CENTCOM, specifically uh, for the defense and security and safety of, of our warfighters that are standing post, conducting patrols, uh, and doing the things they do on a daily basis out here. Uh, these guys here, uh, they put this whole thing together. They actually haven't been on station very long, so it's very impressive how well they put their, they put their exercise together and succeeded in taking down the drones. Reporting from Kabul, Afghanistan, I'm Army Captain Leanna Litch. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's show, and I'm heading out to the Darien jungle here in Panama right now to do some reporting. And so I should have some interesting reports for you later on this week. Thanks for being a part of the Hot Zone. I'm Chuck Holton, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.